American Context on page 40 talks about the America of the mind in the section that we're looking at from, 19, uh, from 1865 to 1914. And we're looking again really at the relationship between realism and other kinds of writing. Realism and idealism, realism and naturalism, realism <laughs> and romanticism. And so I, the introduction told you that this is the rise of realism and the fall of like fantasy or things that are written about castles and princes, things that are written about everyday life in America begin to be um, the primary focus. And the psychological focus is, is often a kind of realism approach. So Henry James terms this the era of discussion where we're trying to get a cultural independence from England and Europe and the tone of these writers when they're writing about Englishmen or people from Europe is highly derisive. It is defensive. It is we are not like you guys, we are better and this is why. Um, it's almost like some people talk about Frenchmen these days. You see this kind of distaste and this desire to separate ourselves from England and more broadly from Europe. Um, one of the things that is of concern in American realism is the, the relationship between realism and imagination. So realism is just listing things that are actually there. That's not creative work, some people might argue. But we'll look at how the imaginative comes into play with realism. One of the things that is of concern begins to be this mandate to write from your experience. And so therefore that might mean that you have to, if you're a woman, you have to write only about women. Or if you're from the South, you have to write only about the South, or even more narrowly, only about New Orleans. More broadly, um, that mandate might say that unless you've lived this, you can't write it, and so you'll have to only write about America. Henry James is a pretty good example of a write, of an American writer who went over to Europe and wrote about Europe. And you get this really nice quote that I liked from Julianne Hawthorne on page 41. It says, it is silly and childish to make the boundaries of the America of the mind coincide with those of the United States. So they wanted to broaden out the imagina imaginative boundaries and to have some imaginative freedom to explore a wide range of experiences or situations, even if they don't themselves experience that. This question is going to become more important when we get to the multicultural area, era, when we talk about who can talk about what and who can't. And, and so we're going to try and broaden it out some, and then later in the semester it might narrow some. I suggested to you last time that this notion that America doesn't have a shadow because it doesn't have dark experiences is a very privileged notion, uh, given the fact that we have all of the slaughter of the uh, Native Americans, we have the enslavement of the African Americans. Um, I think we have plenty of shadow material to talk about, and even at this point, we have um, people beginning to suggest that the true American novelist might be uh, an African American woman. And those are pretty wise words when you consider that Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, um, those two particularly are at the forefront of American novels now. They, they um, stand on the pinnacle. So I think that was a smart um, prediction. William Dean Howells, um, I think, epitomizes some of this privileged perspective of when he's thinking about writing, he seems to be thinking about white male middle class and upper class writing in America. And he says, uh, he suggests that realists should focus on the more smiling aspects of life, which are the more American. So that, pr that prosperous notion, that rags to riches, success story, American dream is what he thinks realism should discuss. I like that phrase, the smiling aspects of life, which are the more American. In contrast, Frank Norris um, was determined to show a wide range of experiences from the slums to the mysteries of sex, so this tantalizing private 
secret place and also the poor, the hardships. This is the kind of stuff I'm much more interested in. So um, as someone who's always looking at um, notions of class, which race is a notion of class, I, I, um, I tend to think that Frank Norris is more right, more correct than Howells. So let's look specifically, though, at Henry James, which starts on 47, in his text, The Art of Fiction, which is a very important essay <coughs> on writing. Um, and he begins to talk about the notion that no novelists must, must write from experience. How many of you have ever heard that? Write from your own experience. Do you agree? <coughs> Write what you know might be another way to say it. Say again? Yeah, I don't either. I mean, it sounds kind of good, and I think I've fallen for it in many, many classes. But as I'm thinking about it right now, why can't I write from my imagination? And I think we are at the end of a long, dry spell of realism, um, hungry for fantasy and magic. Um, so Henry James says at the beginning of this ascendancy of realism in American novels that um, this requirement to write from experience is a little bit strained. He says, what kind of experience is intended and where does it begin and end? Experience is never limited and it is never complete. It is an immense sensibility, a kind of huge spider web of the finest silken thread suspended in the chamber of consciousness and catching every airborne particle in its tissue. Master of Stream of Consciousness, I talked to you about that um, on Wednesday. Henry James is uh, one of the most difficult writers you'll ever read and the most rewarding. Um, looking at how people think in that fantasy with psych psychology that we have, um, there spider webs upon spider webs upon spider webs. That's all he writes about is the psychological drama. His brother, William James, was the preeminent psychologist of the time, but it has been said that perhaps Henry James was the better psychologist and William the better writer. So uh, fulfilled are we by our psychological curiosities when we read a Henry James novel. So he knows what he's talking about in this spider web, and he writes really well about women's thinking and women's experiences, especially in like the novel The Wings of the Dove. So he's a good example of how you don't have to be the kind of person that you're writing about and able to write about them well and faithfully. So he talks about the atmosphere of the mind. He talks about a village damsel writing about the military and what she knows. He talks about experience being only a moment or only an impression. So on the writer's mind, it only takes one small moment to be fodder for experience. Um, the glimpse made a picture. It lasted only a moment, but that moment was experience and she had got her impression. So a good writer doesn't need to just rely on his or her biography. And this brings up a good point that I think you are probably already aware of is the fallacy of authorial intent. What does that mean? Authorial intent is what the author meant for the text to do. So you might say, what was Emily Dickinson trying to do here in this poem? Was she writing about lesbian sex? Is that on her mind? It doesn't matter. What matters is what the text actually does. And when we start looking at an author's biography, of, in other words, their experience, okay, so she's really close with her sister-in-law, and she never leaves her house, and so those are kind of interesting things to apply to the text, but they don't really tell us what the text achieves. It's extra. And so this is another way of saying that experience, if we look at the experience of an author, is only going to tell us so much. And um, my favorite and meanest English professor in undergraduate, we called her Bloody Mary Wilder, would say, the text is all, the text is all. So don't tell me about the biography. Don't worry about whether the author has experience in this area or not. Just look at the words on the page. 
but you'll see us over and over again introducing you to authors, telling you what time period they lived in, whether they were married, how many of their family died. You know, it does give us a context, but it shouldn't be the most important way that we interpret a text. So um, this is one of the most famous quotes about writing. He says on page 49 at the top, Henry James Steele, therefore, if you should certainly say to a novice, write from experience and experience only, I should feel that that was a rather tantalizing monition if I were not carefully immediately to add, and this is a famous quote, try to be one of those people on whom nothing is lost. So, minute detail becomes the calling card of good writers. And we'll show you how Hemingway is the exact opposite of all of that. But so far, we're exhorting writers to write all the details of what they see and feel. Going on, the, the tone of William Dean Howell's criticism in fiction is quite different. And um, this is where he makes the claim that writers should write about the more smiling aspects of American experience. He's a very, very important critic, central to publishing and who gets what done uh, in the time period. So I don't mean to be dismissive of him, I just think that his tone is um, a bit lofty. It's about manners, it's about high society and it's not interested in unseemly things when really I'm almost only interested in unseemly things. So he talks about manners. Um, Howells was a strong and consistent champion of realism which he defined as the truthful treatment of material. Remember in the bigger introduction it said <coughs> there was no truth without beauty. And this, this line of thinking might be um, from Howells, who thought that realism, especially in naturalism and determinism, could get really gritty and really ugly and really uninteresting. And I'm kind of sympathetic with that. I'd like to see something lovely. But I think there are a lot of lovely things in the real world. He says, he goes on to say that Americans are more refined Listen to him describe the Englishman. Um, the love of the passionate and the heroic, as the Englishman has it, is such a crude and unwholesome thing, so deaf and blind to all the most delicate and important facts of life and art, so insensible to the subtle values in either that its presence or absences makes the whole difference and enables one who is not obsessed by it to thank heaven that he is not as that other man is. There can be little question that many refinements of thoughts and spirit which every American is sensible of in the fiction of this continent are necessarily lost upon our good kin beyond the seas. They can't understand it. The subtleties are too difficult for them. Whose thumb-fingered apprehension requires something gross and palpable for its assurance of reality. It's almost the opposite of how we think of the Englishman now. If you want to sound refined and like you have subtle taste, what do you affect? An English accent, right? And so at this point, and then if you, Americans are caricatured as talking too loud and being boorish and not understanding subtleties, Howells makes exactly the opposite argument in this essay. Then he talks about how realism um, can be a book, novels, about things that, in which nothing happens. And that's true. There's not, a, there's not a lot of action. You know, in Hamlet, there are a bunch of different murders. Many, many, many. Everybody lays dead on the stage, and that's the sign of a, a good tragedy if you're in the Elizabethan world with Shakespeare. One person might die in a Henry James novel. Um, there's a lot of consumption going on, which was highly romanticized. But um, it reminds me of what uh, Seinfeld said about his sitcom, which is Jerry Seinfeld, which is this, if there are always stories about nothing, in which nothing happens. And so that begins to be the calling card of American realism, stories in which nothing happens. So you would think that would be really boring, but we're fascinated to look at other people's living rooms, what is happening in their private spaces. 
and not a lot has to happen. You don't have to have large wars. You don't have to have murder and mayhem um, for people for us to be interested in watching other people go about their daily errands. So Howell says nothing happens in American realism. That is, nobody murders or debauches anybody else. There is no arson or pillage of any sort. There's not a ghost or a ravening beast or a hairbreadth escape or a shipwreck or a monster of self-sacrifice or a lady 5,000 years old in the whole course of the story. But you guys um, said that you love Poe, and I think that we might want more ghost by now, right? from the long arc after the century of realism. We want some ghosts and we want some mayhem and I want fairies and uh, fairy queens in every story. <laughs> okay. Um, Hawthorne is the one who said there are so few shadows and inequalities in our broad level of prosperity. Um, it is one of the reflections suggested in Dostoevsky's novel, The Crime and the Punishment, that whoever struck a note so profoundly tragic in American fiction would do a false and mistaken thing. So, Russian novels are profoundly tragic because there's this long, dark Russian history. American novels can't be because we don't have a long, dark history. Did he just forget about the Civil War? I mean, we started the introduction with America recovering from the Civil War. And then we have all these critics saying America has no darkness to deal with. Maybe it was just because it was a couple of decades and not a couple of centuries. Maybe that's, that's the difference. Um, he says, our hunger and our cold is comparatively small. And though all this is changing for the worse, our novelists, therefore, concern themselves with the more smiling aspects of life, which are the more American, and seek the universal in the individual rather than the social interest. And that remains true. We are interested in the individual, that one singular person, over and over and over again. Who, who are you by yourself? I want to know you distinct from the crowd. Uniqueness is hypervalued. Community is less important. Sin and suffering and shame there must always be in the world, I suppose, but I believe that in this new world of ours it is still mainly from one to another and oftener still from one to oneself. We have, a death, we have death to an American, a great deal of disagreeable and painful disease, which the multiplicity of our patent medicines does not seem to cure. But this is tragedy that, that comes in the very nature of things and is not peculiarly American as the large, cheerful average of health and success and happy life is. It will not do to boast, but it is well to be true to the facts and to see that, apart from these purely moral, mortal troubles, the race here has enjoyed conditions in which most of all the ills that have darkened its annals might be averted by honest work and unselfish behavior. Viva the American dream. If you work hard enough, you will succeed. We are all kings and princes and princesses and queens. Um, this is a white upper class man's fantasy of what America is. In the middle of labor disputes and Irishmen and Italians suffering rampant racism, ongoing problems getting African Americans equal rights to vote and land ownership and home ownership, not to mention nobody's getting paid very well. So um, soon enough, we'll have a lot of troubles and people who get voices who say, we have a lot of American darkness unique to the American continent. The next thing I want to point out, though, is this notion of hysterical women, which is really important. What is a hysterical woman? One with opinions. One with opinions. What is the root of the word history? Mm -mm. And not, and not history, hysteria. My bad. Hysteria. What other word sounds like hysteria? Not history, but hysterectomy. Hysterical women can't keep their reproductive organs in place. They're wandering all over their body. They have what's called wandering uteruses, and they need to calm down. Yeah. And we'll get to that in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper and what psychologists and doctors did in the Victorian era to try and get women to get their uteruses in place and stop being hysterical. 
So anytime you hear the word hysterical, I think you should be offended and you should tell people why. Um, so <laughs> you have it here on page 54. Fine artists we have among us and right-minded as far as they go, and we must not forget that this at evil moments when it seems as if all the women had taken to writing hysterical improprieties and some of the men were trying to be at least as hysterical in despair of being as improper. So there's a bunch of improper women writing all these dime novels about romance, like love, that kind of romance. They're um, hysterical because they're just, it's just basically soap operas, and people are loving it. Um, it reminds me of Hawthorne complaining about the mobs of scribbling women that he were getting published, but he had trouble getting published against these wildly popular mobs of scribbling women. So you see some of the sexism that's going on in uh, the battle for what will be American literature and what will be good American literature. And at this point, sentimentalism, oh dear reader, oh you reader, um, becomes denigrated. We have objectivity, we have science, we have cold reason that shows up in the psychological novels. And again, down with women's ways of knowing, with intuition, um, with anything that seems to be too emotional. <coughs> so those are both um, results of the Enlightenment and the, the new scientific movement and a sort of sexism that is trying to get men, can keep men published and keep women from being published. Which leads me to what I think is the best essay in this section by Frank Norris called A Plea for Romantic Fiction, which is a capital R. Um, we talked about that in the earlier section. He says, romanticism um, should be in fiction alongside realism, while sentimentalism should be handed down the scullery stairs. So high-minded romantics versus sentimentalism, we'll try to piece that out. Many people today are composing mere sentimentalism and calling it and causing it to be called romance so that those who are too busy to think much upon these subjects but who nonetheless love honest literature, romance too has fallen in disrepute. So he's trying to show the difference. Romance is about your relationship to nature, about um, awe and wonder, about the individual Promethean spark, divine uh, connection with the gods. And he talks about how within realism we can find um, romance. Can we not see in it an instrument keen, finely tempered, and flawless, an instrument with which we may go straight through the clothes and tissues and wrappings of flesh down deep into the red living heart of things? So we're digging deep into what makes a person, make, what makes humanity tick, what makes people tick. Why should it be that so soon as the novelist addresses himself seriously to the consideration of contemporary life, he must abandon romance and take up all that harsh, loveless, colorless, blunt tool called realism? So Frank Norris wants to look at the slums. He wants to look at sex. He wants to look at all the difficulties of life, but he wants to do it creatively, magically, and beautifully. It doesn't have to be harsh and ugly, in other words. He says that too many people define romance as not able to treat the sordid or the unlovely. And he calls William Dean Howells a sort of deacon. Um, he says uh, others, he means Howells, um, think that it has to be as respectable as a church and as proper as a deacon, for instance, in the novels of Mr. Howells. But he says, realism should not stultify itself to deal only with the surface of things. It must be a minute, um, it is, he says, the drama of the broken teacup. I really like that concept. Realism is the drama of the broken teacup the tragedy of a walk down the block, the excitement of an afternoon call, the adventure of an invitation to dinner. So all this kind of excitement in this middle class, everyday 
working man and woman's family life. So he begins to personify romance in his essay, and he calls her a she. He said, she would come upon a great hope amid the books and papers of the study table of the young man's room, and perhaps, who knows, an affair or great heavens and intrigue in the scented ribbons and gloves and hairpins of the young lady's bureau. And she would pick here a little and there a little, making up a bag of hopes and fears and a package of joys and sorrows, great ones, mind you, and then come down to the front door and stepping out in the street, hand you the bags and package and say to you, that is life. So these great emotions within these simple private worlds. And then he finishes the essay. There's so much that I love about it, but um, towards the end on page 59 at the bottom, he tells us why we read in very simple terms. And I put this quote on my office door when I read it the other day. <clears throat> Again, she is romance right now. So, if haply she should call you to you from the squalor of a dive or the awful, awful degradation of a disorderly house crying, look, listen, this too is life. These two are my children. Look at them, know them, and knowing, help. Should she call thus, you would stop your ears, you would avert your eyes, and you would answer, come from there, romance, your place is not there. But did you see that, what we were talking about, why we write and why we read? To know and then what? To help. And so he makes that call. Witness to poverty, witness to degradation, and then do something about it. Which is why I like this essay so much. Um, and he says that writing should not merely be about amusement, but it should be about teaching. So it should teach you by showing God help, God help you if at last you take from romance her mission of teaching. If you do not believe that she has a purpose, a nobler purpose and a mightier than mere amusement, mere entertainment. Let realism do the entertaining with its meticulous presentation of teacups, rag carpets, wallpaper, and haircloth sofas, stopping with these, going no deeper than it sees, choosing the ordinary, the untroubled, and the commonplace. But to romance belongs the wide world for range and the unplumbed depths of the human heart and the mystery of sex and the problems of life and the black, unsearched penetralia of a soul of man. So, read that carefully. Um, I don't like the suspicion of sentimentalism, but I do like the notion of, of the importance of why we read and write.